Okay, it's seven o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Here we go with our uh, wonderful weekly thing that I do. It's my Q&A, and we try to cover a subject every week when we do this. But I want to make everybody aware that I have a whole bunch of different things I do. I have six things that I'm doing, and I want you to know about them so that I can help you have the very best farm in the world. I want you to be able to create food. We have a serious problem in this world, and the world is there's not enough good, healthy food options for people who want them. And most people can grow a lot of their own food, so I'm trying to teach people how to do that. And a lot of people can create a business selling good food that they raise to their own community. And I can help you do that, too. I'm all about the um, production of food so you guys can learn how to do this. So I have my free YouTube channel, and there's new content that comes out weekly. Sometimes it's one video, sometimes it's uh, five or six uh, videos. And I have my Zoom meeting every Thursday night. That's what this is. And then I have my Patreon page. That's a subscription that you can go to, and you can subscribe to watch my video library. I have over 300 videos on there that you can see of how to grow nutrient-dense food. I have my 17-week farmer training course. This has been fun. This is the year, first year I've done that, and graduation is in two days for my first uh, cohort of students. They've been working very hard all summer, and they've been learning amazing things. We've done our oral examinations, and these kids know what they're talking about. It's brilliant. It's designed for young people who want to start a business. Any age is welcome. It's not really built for teenagers, but teenagers is who signed up and came this year. So I took them. So it's pretty great. Uh, I'm a soil laboratory. I can do soil tests to tell you what succession you are in so that we can help you control weeds and help you grow the crops you want. And I also do consulting. If you're wanting to start a farm, I do consulting to help you grow food. Let's get into our subject tonight. Our subject is weed management. We're all about the weeds here. And weeds are pretty awesome. Let me just tell you, I really like weeds. And this is usually not what people hear when we talk about weed management, are weeds a problem? Absolutely, they're a problem. Do they cost farmers millions and probably billions of dollars in management every year worldwide? Yes, I think they do. So they can be a problem. So why would I say I like them? Well, I will explain later. How do we stop weeds from growing? So I'm going to just feed you with a fire hose real quick about how to manage weeds. And then we're going to get into what weeds actually are from an ecological point of view. So when we're trying to grow food, if you are tilling the soil, you are selecting for weed germination. Weeds want to grow in disturbed soil. So if you are doing a no-till type system, you want to hoe your weeds very shallowly when they do come up. Because you will have weeds. There will always be a weed that you need to manage. So hold the weeds shallowly, less than a half an inch deep. That helps to stop bringing up the deep seed bank. You don't want to bring that seed bank up. If you have very noxious weeds like bindweed and crabgrass and uh, morning glory, those types of noxious weeds that are very hard to control, you can control those with a tarp. If you have a, a piece of land and it's infested with these, I would suggest tarping it with a silage tarp that they sell for uh, people to make silage out of, like cattlemen who are making silage. They sell these tarps. They're white on one side, black on the other. They're very tough tarps. They don't decompose very easy at all. They're really tough. The wind doesn't rip them very well. You can put that on your land, and you can get these in really big tarp sizes. So if your garden was 100 feet long by 100 feet wide, you can get a tarp that size, and you can put the tarp on your piece of land to control these noxious weeds. And I would suggest tarping it for maybe one year to a year and a half to kill those weeds. And you just leave it on there. It kills out all of the vegetation, and you start fresh and new. That is one way to do it. So this is not something you would do for a quick, uh, like a, a really fast... Um, like, like if you're going to start growing food next week, tarping's not going to do you any good. You don't tarp it for a week and then take the tarp off. 
That's not going to work. This is for a long-term thing. You know you're going to want to be farming a piece of land in a couple of years. Tarp it. Kill out those noxious weeds and then start over. The other way you can do this, um, you on pretty much on any ground, even with the noxious weeds like crabgrass and morning glory, you can put a thick cardboard on the ground. So three or four layers of cardboard. You need to make sure you're overlapping the gaps in the cardboard. Overlap them six, eight inches. So four or five layers. And then you put six to 10 inches of compost on top of that cardboard and you plant directly in the car in the compost the second you do it. Don't cut a hole in the cardboard. Just have your uh, compost material thick enough that you can plant right in it. And that'll work very good. This normally um, kills out almost all grass. Uh, you know, you may have some weeding to do, but it's very rare. Um, once you establish that. So this is how we do this. If you've attended my boot camps or if you're planning to attend a boot camp of mine, we actually do this. We build a garden like that during boot camp so you can learn how to do this. It's very hands-on. You come here, you learn how to, to make that happen. The question is, how do we view weeds? What is our view of weeds? The modern agricultural view of weeds is that weeds are a bad thing. Weeds are something to be killed. Weeds are something to be um, gotten rid of. Weeds are something to torment man. Weeds are something to um, punish the farmer. Depending on the literature you read and the life you have lived, people view weeds very differently. If you come from an ecological view, weeds are an indicator of what succession we are in. Now, we've already talked about succession in these um, classes. But uh, but we need to just review it really quick for this lesson here. Ecological succession is what the world is trying to do naturally. Um, think of think of Hawaii with the volcanoes. There is brand new land being formed in Hawaii right now, and there has been our entire lives. The the volcanoes are erupting very. They're gentle. The land is growing. The islands are getting bigger. It's brand new land. The first plants that grow on that volcanic rock are mosses and lichens. And after a few years, you start getting early succession, um, more organized plants that actually have root systems and stems and leaves and flowers. And you're going to get the annual plants growing. And then you start getting grasses that grow. Then you start getting perennials that grow. And then you get uh, the perennial grasses and bushes, and then you start getting trees. And eventually, think of the redwood forest in Northern California, of a late succession uh, forest where you have plants that have been that way for thousands of years. This is what Mother Nature tries to do. It tries to go from bare earth to an old growth forest. And everywhere we look on earth, Mother Nature is trying to do this. Now, sometimes there are things that, like environmental conditions, that are making other things happen, like it's going the opposite way. It's going from a forest or from a grassland to a desert. In fact, it's one of the biggest ecological problems we have today is that uh, the... Um, Deserts are growing. Deserts are growing rapidly. Right now, we are losing the size of Pennsylvania every year globally to desertification, meaning the earth is turning into a desert. Now, there's a lot of places that are also turning into grasslands, but that is, that is in the equation. The desertification is winning globally. And so that's a bad thing, and we need to fight against that. The, the number one um, organism on the earth that can stop desertification is the human being. Humans can stop desertification, and they can stop it rapidly. And they can stop it very quick when they understand these very simple principles uh, that I have been um, teaching in these classes. Okay. Now, the one number one tool that humans can use to stop desertification are cattle. The number two tool 
is compost. And so that's if humans are involved. What if humans are not involved? What if it's just ecology? It's just nature. What is the number one tool that is used by nature? And that is the early succession plants. And humans call those early succession plants weeds. So the ecological definition of a weed is an early succession plant that will grow where there has been a disturbance in the earth. We call those natural disasters or catastrophes. So if there has been a catastrophe like a, a bad wind, it would be to, it would need to be a major wind that stripped the uh, earth bare. It would be a flood that stripped the earth bare. It could be a volcano that covered new stone onto the earth. Um, so these are the types of catastrophes that happen in Mother Nature that make bare earth. Now, if humans are involved, we often, and I've done it millions of times, probably not millions, but many, many times I have plowed fields with all kinds of farm implement because I am a farmer. I love farming. I love disking the earth. Well, ecologically speaking, the earth creates um, these, these, you know, these natural disasters, and there needs to be a way to repair that earth, to take it from bare earth to an old growth forest, because ecology teaches us that this is what tries to happen. It tries to become the forest. So how does that happen? Well, the first thing that happens are the weeds. Weeds are the first responder. And if we think about a first responder, we think of firemen and policemen who show up to a disaster quickly to try to take control of the situation and fix the problem and save the people who can be saved, the survivors. And in ecology, the the weeds are the early, uh, they're those first responders, those early seeds that will sprout. They sprout and they grow. But how does this actually heal the earth? And it certainly does heal, heal the earth because they will grow quickly in a damaged soil or brand new soils. And then they create a lot of biomass and then they die and winter snows or, or winds or animals will knock those weeds onto the ground. And then those weeds will feed fungus. Uh, that dry biomass will feed the fungus. And then the fungus will begin to put the nutrients uh, available for more desirable plants. So the mid succession plants. So Mother Nature left alone can grow from early to mid, from early succession to mid-succession, maybe in five years, eight years, ten years. Humans can do it in one year. So this is great because we know how this works. We have observed Mother Nature and how she repairs the earth, and we can speed it up very quickly. In fact, we can go from early succession to late succession in less than a decade. Mother Nature may take 5,000 years. We don't want to wait around 5,000 years. So how do we manage weeds? If we are, uh, if we are a, like an agriculture person, if we are managing a farm and we need to control weeds, then you need to look at my previous slide that I already showed right here. And these are the things that we actually do. We want to uh, look at these. We want to... Oops, sorry. We want to look at these. These are the things we focus on. We focus on not tilling the soil. We focus on, you know, using cardboard, using tarps. Um, when we do have weeds, we need to cultivate very shallowly. Um, those types of things will stop the weeds from growing. We need to be putting the, the uh, you know, the compost on the soil. So the, this is what we're doing. Um, uh, no, I'm just going to go back to the other chart real quick right here on ecological succession. There's one more major thing we can do, and this is how we use compost. And we've had previous classes on compost. So if you haven't seen those, go to YouTube, look them up, watch the recordings. Um, Patreon has many of these videos. And of course, I'm available for consulting if you need to know right now. So what can we do? We take the compost, we make an extract, and if we have a compost that has lots of fungus in it, 
I'm going to get my cursor going here. So got my cursor here, right here on late succession. Hopefully you can see that. We have our compost that's made for late succession. The compost has the same organisms in it that you will find in late succession. And when we pour that on early succession crops, it takes 10 seconds to pour it on the garden. We have actually changed our early succession to late succession. So now the weeds will die out naturally, not all of them, but your earliest succession weeds will begin to die. And we have created a, a condition because we combined the organisms of late succession in our compost and we put it in early succession. So we combined late and early, which equals mid succession. So if you're mathematically minded, hopefully you understood that equation. Okay. Early is what we have. Late is what our compost is. We combine those together. And now we've created mid-succession. Here's the glory of this. The glory is most of our food crops grow in mid-succession soils. So if we have a pretty bad soil that's infested with weeds, the, the weeds are an ecological indicator that we are in early succession. So when I hear people say, oh, well, all my garden will grow is weeds, I say, oh, that's fantastic. You can grow all kinds of food there. Make an excellent compost, put it on your garden, and you're going to be able to grow every crop you can with much, many less weeds next year. It sounds too good to be true. It's not too good to be true because it is true. What it is is complex. Okay, This is not complicated. It's actually simple, but it is complex. So it takes some education to get to the simplicity on the other side of complexity. We have to go through all of this complexity to understand it. So I just told you the simple part, okay? So uh, I like weeds because weeds are an ecological indicator that I am in early succession. And I really like that. Because that helps me to know what to do with my garden. So so there we are on weed management. Hopefully this made sense. I know it was brief, but these little podcast Zoom meetings are supposed to be brief. So let's open this up for questions. You can type your questions in or you can uh, go to the chat box and you can type your question. And the question time can be about our uh, subject tonight or anything to do with your garden. If you have a garden problem right now, let's talk about it and let's fix it. It is September, the beginning of September, so it's time to plant your fall gardens if you haven't already. But the, an amazing amount of food can be grown in, in the winters. So hopefully this is helping you to be great farm managers, great food producers, and as soon as you unmute yourself and ask a question, I will do my best to answer it. And I promise you, if I don't know, I will say I don't know, because I think it's wrong to tell people lies. So I'm not going to make anything up. I have a question. Okay, Ezekiel, let's hear it. So when you're talking about planting uh, a winter uh, grain variety, let's say winter wheat. Um, do you need to be particularly conscious of variety when it comes to your altitude? I know that that matters for a lot of fruiting stuff. And I'm wondering if there are any varieties that are better for a high altitude like we have in Utah. Uh, so yes, uh, it does matter. Most wheats are classed either spring wheat or winter wheat. So if the cold temperatures of winter are going to kill it, it's called spring wheat. So there's probably 100 varieties of spring wheat. There's probably a 1,000 varieties or more of winter wheat. I recently took a class on seeds. It was two winters ago. And they taught us that there are over 10,000 varieties of wheat worldwide today. And I questioned them on that. I said, did you say 10,000 varieties? They said, yes, there are 10,000 viable varieties available today. And the sad thing is we've lost 
thousands of varieties over the last couple of hundred years because people just quit growing them. So who knows how many varieties of wheat there were back in the day when every clan, think think 500 years ago before there were semi-trucks and anything like that. Every clan, meaning you know a, a group of family groups, so every couple of hundred people living all around the earth had their own varieties of wheat that they would grow. It was pretty amazing, you know, fascinating. So the quick answer is yes. For high mountain altitudes of like the, you know, where I live in the Great Basin Desert, Utah, uh, Nevada, Idaho, those types of places, you do want a variety that will grow in your area. But if you just get wheat from a farmer who has been growing it in your area, it obviously grew. So that's a good way to go. Good question, Zeke. Thank you. Next question. Let me open my chat. I see somebody typed in there. Okay, so um, Ephraim said, he typed here, what are the indicators of mid-succession? So that is a good question. So let's just refer to our chart here. I'm going to put my, uh, my cursor on this chart. So early succession, you're going to have annuals. If you look at the very bottom of this chart, oh, sorry, I, I went to the wrong slide. So if you look at the bottom of this chart, it's the very earliest are one-celled plants like algae, okay? And then you have multiple-celled plants like lichens and mosses. Then you have annual plants. And an annual plant is a plant that grows, um, like it, it sprouts from a seed in the spring. It will flower. It will make seed. It dies in one growing season. And then those seeds would fall on the ground. The next year, those they sprout again. So those are annual plants. So if you have a, a, a garden that's totally annuals, it's very early succession. Okay. So mid-succession, I'm finally getting to your to answer your question here. So mid-succession would be perennial plants. And yeah, there can be a lot of weeds in uh, mid-succession, but in mid-succession, your uh your bacteria to fungus ratio is gonna be more equal. Okay, so an indicator of mid-succession are perennials. So if you have a grassland where the buffalo roam and the antelope play and all that, and it's just a beautiful grassland, that's mid-succession. If you have trees growing, if it's a forest, that's an indicator of late succession. But remember, these are indicators, weeds, or, or let's just say annuals, perennials, and forests. These are indicators of the three basic successions. But, you've, but they are not absolutes of those because you could have a forest and some catastrophe happened that killed the microbes in the soil and now it is early succession, but it's still growing a forest. What you will see over a period of time, maybe one or two or three decades, is that forest dies. So you could have a forest that is early succession and it's dying out. So are we seeing forests die anywhere in the world today? Yes, we are. There are a lot of forests that are dying. Foresters are trying to figure it out. There are grasslands that are dying. Uh, people are range scientists. They're trying to figure it out. And what we have figured out so far, which is pretty accurate. In fact, we could almost say that it's absolute truth, but it is science. So when we say absolute truth, that's ba a bad way to answer. But it's a very strong theory. I think it's as strong a theory as gravity, okay? We think that gravity is a fact. Gravity is not a scientific fact. Gravity is a scientific theory, and until we understand it better, we call it a fact, okay? But scientists shouldn't call it a fact. So let me get to my point. The way that we take succession, the way that we actually say this is the succession, the strongest way to know that is not the indicator of the plant. It is the microbes in the soil. We have got to understand that the microbes in the soil are the best um, theory to know what succession we're in. So if I pull a soil sample from a piece of ground that is, and I do a microscopic test on it, that is the best way for me to tell you if it's early succession, mid-succession, or late succession. Now remember, that if it is early succession, you will have indicators. You can just walk out there and look at it 
And if you have a bunch of annual plants, you can guess in the 90% range. So it's pretty accurate. In the 90% range, this is early succession. If I go into the uh, to a grassland and it's all perennials growing there, then you can have other other mid succession that's not uh, grassland. Okay, but it, it, but if you go into an ecosystem and it's all perennials, then you can say within 90%, you can simply say yes, this is mid succession because it's perennials, and it's the same with late succession. You walk into a forest. You can guess within 90% accuracy that this is late succession. But to get to 99.999999% accuracy, which is as good as we can get with science, because we can never get 100% because in a decade, somebody will have more research and they'll prove our theory wrong. That always happens with science. But to get to that 99.9999% theory, of what your succession actually is, we have to do that with a soil sample. It's very easy to do with a trained lab. And so I can pull a soil sample and look at your soil. So if, here again, I'll just go through this again real quick to answer your question, Ephraim. If I wanna know what mid-succession is, I walk out and I look at my garden. And if it's filled with a whole bunch of perennials, I can guess with 90% accuracy that it's mid-succession. If I wanted to know 99.999% accuracy, then I would pull a soil sample. And if I have the proper ratios of bacteria and fungus, which is about one to one, the same amount of biomass of bacteria and fungus, then I'm probably in mid-succession, okay? If I have more fungus than bacteria, I'm in late succession. If I have less fungus and more bacteria, I'm in early succession. Now, if I have a very healthy soil where I don't need to use fertilizers in my mid-succession garden, then that's going to tell me that I have, um, then what I would see under the microscope is not only a one-to-one -one ratio of bacteria and fungus, but I would also want to see the higher uh, predator system in there. I'd want to see the protozoa group. I'd want to see the microarthropod group. I'd want to see the nematode group. And then we get to our macroarthropods, which all your macros means you don't need a microscope to see them. So we would want to see a large, um, a large group of all the other bugs that are in there. We'd want to see incotraids. We'd want to see the earthworm group. We would want to see all the creepy crawlies, all the centipedes, all those arthropods. And then if we see a high volume of those, especially the protozoa and the nematode, then we're going to think, you know what, this is such a good soil. Maybe the mineral cycle is working fine, and I don't need any, um, any fertilizer at all. And you could do side-by-side -side, um, tests to do that. So you could have a field or a garden full of whatever crop you're growing and go right down the middle of the crop and spread some uh, commercial fertilizer. And if your plants grow better there, then you know your mineral cycle is not working good. Because when your soil functions, if you spread fertilizer, you shouldn't see any, um, any plant response that looks better from where you put the fertilizer than where it um, normally is. So that's... Uh... <laughs> So that's that. Hopefully that answered your question, Ephraim. Let me scroll up here. I'm getting a couple of uh, uh, questions in the chat box. In a controlled environment like a greenhouse, so Ephraim, I happen to know that you're building some greenhouses. So uh, you, you are going to have very disturbed ground in that greenhouse. Mother Nature will see that as an ecological disaster. It will wake up the seed bank and you will have weeds growing everywhere the first year. So what you want to do is get sprinklers in there. As soon as the greenhouse is completed and done and you're ready to plant, the first thing you do is go in there, turn on sprinklers, spr sprinkle that for 28, uh, 24 to 48 hours to soak that ground really good. Uh, so that the weeds will come up and then cover the entire thing with a tarp. Leave that tarp on for about two weeks. You will have a bazillion weed seeds sprout. And since they can't get light because the black tarp is on there, they will die. And then move the tarp off and plant. And remember not to, to dig very much in there because you'll be bringing up the weed seeds. So just go put transplants in. 
So that will work. Um, I've done that. I did that in my Wallapini here in, in Nevada. It worked great. I've done it many other times throughout my life. It works really good. Um, just sprout those seeds quick and then uh, and then move on. So that'll be pretty good. All right, Stephanie made it. She's one of my Patreon members. I'm glad you're here. And she asks, potato bugs, earwigs are potato bugs and earwigs are good. They're absolutely good. Now, you've got to remember that sometimes people think earwigs are a pest, and we've already had a class on pests, but I'm going to answer your question right here. If you see the bugs eating your crops, then ecologically speaking, now remember that's different than agriculturally speaking, but ecologically speaking, the bugs think that your plants are so unhealthy that they need to uh, clean those up. They think they're already about to decompose because the ecological role of a pest or a disease is to clean up unhealthy and dying crops. And boy, that makes farmers mad when I say that. But if we could all shift our thinking to think along these lines, it would help us to, to fix our, our soils so we didn't have the pests eating that stuff. I mean, I have every pest species that in in the Western United States in my greenhouse right now, and I'm having like like one percent damage is all. I'm having very little damage because my soil is functioning. So they're there. What are they doing? What are they living on? They're living on the old leaves. They're helping decompose the compost. They're doing their ecological role, which is great. Okay, Ezekiel DeMell asks, um, question. I have a large worm bin. I've been diligently feeding and watering them. But as summer wears on, I'm struggling to come up with more food for them. Will they starve to death if I can't get them as much food as I've been giving them? No, they won't. You do want a thick detritus sphere on top of them to go over the winter. You want your worm bin to probably have one or two feet of hay or straw on top. And they will migrate up into it. But during the cold weather, when it starts freezing, they will go down to where it's not frozen. And so if your worm bin's outside, and I happen to know that yours is because we've talked. If your worm bin is on a solid floor, I think yours is just on the ground. I don't remember. But if you have plastic or concrete or something that they can't get through, you better have it be three or four feet thick or they will die. They'll freeze to death if that compost pile um, um, freezes. The freezing weather that's coming in three or four months this winter, it's going to kill them unless they can get down. But they'll burrow into the ground where the frost line, below the frost line, they'll be fine. So they're not going to die. And I know you, that wasn't exactly a question, but that was important. You needed to know that. Um, there are times when you can go for four or five months without feeding the worms. You've got to remember, the worms are not eating the decomposing organic matter. Yes, they open their mouth like this, ah, and they chomp all that stuff. And whatever fits in their mouth will go through the digestive system. But the actual nutrition they get is the is the microbes that are in there. So the the bacteria, the fungus, the protozoa, the nematodes, all of those things that are small enough to fit in their mouth, those microscopic organisms, that's what they actually digest. So those things are going to last in a compost for up to two years. So your earthworms are fine for two or three or four months when you don't have enough uh, food to put on there. So you should be fine. But you wouldn't want to go more than six or seven months without putting fresh, new food on there. And I don't put uh, undigested. By digested, I mean composted. It's the same thing in my mind. But I don't put the un uncomposted uh, stuff into the into the worm bin. Like I don't just dump grass clippings right on my worm bin. I compost that first, and it goes through a hot phase. So I turn it four or five, six times. Like I have videos on how to do that on Patreon, and then I take those and I put those in the on top of the worm bin, and so that's pretty great. And, and that's the way I manage it, manage it because um, because I like to manage it that way. But let me just be really clear. The reason I manage it that way is because the hot compost does two things. It kills your weed seeds and it kills pathogens. If you put pathogens on a worm bin, they will kill the pathogens. So I don't 
um, thermophilic compost at first to kill pathogens. I um, I only put it in the thermophilic one to kill the weed seeds first because go a weed seed going through a worm does not kill it. It probably helps it sprout better. I've never read a scientific article on that, but I'll bet you that's true. And I'll bet you there's a lot of articles on it. I just happen haven't happened to uh, find the research where they actually um, developed a theory on that. The lay world says the scientists proved it. If you're a good scientist, you're going to say we developed a theory. I like that better. Okay. Stephanie says, it makes sense. My unhealthy corn had earwigs eating it, but my healthy corn had earwigs on it, but my corn was growing and fine. Perfect. Yeah, see, that works. This actually works. We just need to think about it in ecological terms. Good. Um, Ezekiel said, I just hit three feet thick in my worm bin. Good. Three feet thick, they're probably going to make it through the winter fine. But I would make sure that it's not freezing all the way through. And if it is, do something drastic, like add more mulch on top. Stephanie said, I really like the cardboard method, but I know the cardboard will eventually degrade. Yes, that's exactly what we want. We want it to decompose. That cardboard is going to feed the fungus. It'll only it'll, it should degrade in about two months after you put it on there. And she continues, will the weeds underneath come up and fill my garden? And then I know my cardboard is gone and it needs to be replaced. Nope. Uh, if you have the really bad weeds that are hard to kill, I'm going to name three of them. Bindweed, Morning Glory, most people think those are the same, and quack grass. If you have those, you need five or six layers of cardboard because then it'll take four or five months for it to decompose. If you just have a lawn, if it's just lawn, if your lawn is growing dandelions and different kinds of grass and maybe some clovers, you're just fine to put down one layer of cardboard and it'll work just fine. Okay, hopefully that answered that question. Ezekiel says, man, I haven't been composting my stuff before putting it into my worms. So would my worm castings be bad for potting soil? No, it just takes longer. And if you are putting weed seeds in there, you will be planting weeds when you put your compost out there. It's not that you did it wrong, Ezekiel. There's different ways to do it. With your very busy lifestyle, it's probably not a bad idea because you're at the office all day long. I know your schedule because you've told me and you don't have time to garden all day. So it's fine to do it that way. But just realize that if you're putting weed seeds on there, you haven't killed the weed seeds yet. That's the beauty of a thermophilic compost. So you may have to pull some weeds. But no, it'll still make a good compost once it's done. It just takes longer for the worms to digest it all. Okay, Stephanie says, I have healthy tomato plants, but I occasionally get a hornworm. Are my tomato plants unhealthy, like my corn and earwig example? Same question with squash bugs. Were my pumpkins dying and the squash bugs helping the pumpkins to degrade like the earwigs? Okay, we had this, uh, Helena asked this well, maybe two weeks ago about the corn, the corn worm, or the, the tomato hornworm. Um, and I don't know the answer. I think that my theory stands solid and strong with all animals out there. If you have an absolute functioning soil, you will have plants that are resistant to anything that's going to eat that plant. Now, what if a human eats that plant? Are we going to become, are we going to die? <laughs> I mean, we don't want our soil to be that healthy. So, I mean, how far am I going to take this thought, you know? So maybe maybe the the uh maybe the hornworm on the tomatoes, maybe they don't die when they eat a healthy plant. I simply don't know the answers to all this stuff. I do know that uh, we need a lot more researchers doing a lot more research on this. We need millions more people getting master's degrees and PhDs doing really good science, figuring some of this stuff out. This is a new science, and we need more people doing this. If you know, know somebody who's bored in their life, let's have them start some research projects. I wish I could answer that. Theoretically, yes, it stands true for most things, but we don't have all the answers yet. So that's not the, 
so it doesn't necessarily mean that you had unhealthy plants, Stephanie, but um, but maybe. I mean, I don't know. It would be neat to do some side-by-side -side trials. We, we know that your area there of Riverton, Utah, where you live, is uh, uh, like it's infested with squash bugs. It's awful. I mean, it's very hard for people to grow any kinds of cucurbits there because the squash bugs wipe them out. And so, and I think they've become resistant to a lot of the poisons that people use because people just use all kinds of poisons. So now it's harder and harder to kill them because we're creating super bugs. But it'd be fantastic to do a side-by-side -side soil. If you took part of your garden and you inoculated it very, very good and you did the soil tests and you figured out that you knew that that soil was as healthy as possible. And it might may take five years of growing um, in that soil to get to that point where you have an absolute perfectly functioning soil, at least as perfect as we can get. And then you put a bunch of squash in there and then you just see, see if the bugs destroy those plants. The other thing is genetics. Sometimes there's certain um, genetics in plants that even in not a very good soil, the genetics of the plant will just, those genes are turned on to protect the plant. So we need to be saving seed from any curcubit. And if you don't know what curcubit means, it's, it's just the family of plants of um, squashes, melons, and cucumbers, and all the varieties of those guys. Those are curcubits. And squash bugs attack all those. Um, so, you know, we need to be saving seeds from the ones that are resistant to those and then replanting those so that we can um, keep going with the the genetics that are resistant to all that stuff. Um, okay. I have a quick so, follow-up question to that, um, if I may. Um, so I have a pretty bad uh, squash bug infestation here as well. And I I noticed that when my basil was growing, because I, I planted all my curcubits in my basil in the same place. Before I harvested my basil, I barely saw a squash bug. When I harvested my basil, they took over. So I think that helped, at least partially. But my, my, my question isn't about that. My question is, uh, so now some of my pumpkins that I've harvested, my little pumpkins that are getting ripe about right now to make pies and stuff with, have a potato bug or, or squash bug scars on them, the, the white kind of calloused area. If I just cut that off, is it still good to eat or do I need to be concerned about pathogenicity? There's no plant pathogen that I know of that is transferable to humans. I have never heard of that. You're not going to get sick from a plant that a bug was a vector for and moved that poison from one or the or disease or whatever from one to another. The only time a plant is poisonous is if it creates alkaloids. And that's just in the normal groups of um, poisonous plants. So no, no, a bug damage on plants. Some There has been research done. I don't know how good the research is, but it's fascinating that people have published this, that plants that have scars from insects are more healthy. They have more vitamins, more nutrients, because they had to because the immune systems of the plants kicked in and the, so those have more nutrition which is fascinating because you never can buy those at the grocery store because nobody would ever buy a blemished fruit so if that's true then that means that our most nutritious foods are being thrown away and being recomposted which is a fascinating thought but uh, but I, I don't even know. I don't know how to know if that's even true science. But there's a lot of people who've been researching that. Here again, we need more researchers to do more case studies to try to figure out the truth of all this stuff. Good question, Ezekiel. Um, Ephraim had a question here. Let me read this real quick. If I use a store-bought potting soil, with su what succession will it be? And how can I optimize it inoculation? Um I've never thought about that. Let me think about that. Just assume that it's early succession and give it lots of good inoculation from your compost. That's what I would do with that. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Stephanie, unmute yourself and ask your question. 
Sorry, I didn't take too long to type, so I just figured I'd just ask you. Um, I like what Ezekiel said about the basil because I have watermelon next to my pumpkins and um, the the squash bugs, it, my pumpkins did grow to maturity and then the plant started to die. And I'm, I don't know if the squash bugs killed it, but I might, I do have pumpkins that are, that are harvestable and I just cut them off and, and composted and threw away and squished all the squash bugs. Um, the watermelon that was right next to that pumpkin um, in the same row, that one didn't die. It was even intermingled with it. It was, it just didn't, it just grew, it, it just not really growing. It could have gotten much, much bigger like my other ones in the next row. Like they're, they're three feet apart. Um, there's a row in between them. But well, like big Ezekiel said, I do have oregano and I do have basil right there next to my peppers, right next to my watermelon, right next to my cantaloupe, and they are growing just fine. So I hope I will do that again next year. I'll grow some basil with my, my curcubits. I guess that's what you call it. And I'll see if that works. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, that's what I would recommend. Let me just go back and remind, um, let me just remind you of some simple soil health principles that we don't talk about in our world today, unless you're a geek like me about all this stuff. But the, the latest science in the last decade has shown that for plants to be able to show pest resistance and disease resistance, they need the microbe community in the soil to turn on those genetics. One of the main thing that, things that viruses do in animals, in people, in plants, is they turn on certain genes. That's one of the purposes. And when I, when I say a word like virus, a lot of times we're scared because we think disease. There's a lot of viruses that don't cause disease, but they're but they um, they're so they're beneficial. Okay, so a lot of the things that the good viruses can do is turn on genetics that we're not using. But if we have, uh, let's say we had one garden plot. Let's just say a hundred feet by a hundred feet. So a big garden, and we're growing one crop in there. Let's just say corn, but we could pick anything. One crop, and we keep all the weeds out of it. So it looks really nice. It's very manicured. It's beautiful. It looks good. The crops grow big. They're, they're wonderful. We take pictures of it. We send it into magazines. People send us praise. We feel good. We win awards for gardens that look like that. Well, guess what? The roots of the corn or any monocrop, they don't grow a large enough microbiome because the plants grow the plant roots are in charge of how many microbes are growing so one crop doesn't grow a big enough one to be able to turn on those secondary metabolites inside of those plants but when we have four plant families growing together oh uh, just so you know your connection kind of died Right when you started talking about monocrops. Thank you. I'll repeat that. So when we have a monocrop, it's not enough uh, roots to grow a large community of microbes. Sometimes monocrops can have less than 25,000 species of bacteria in the soil. That is nothing. A healthy soil should have more than 250,000 microbes in the soil. Okay, the species, different species, 250. Okay, are we back yet? Welcome back, Pa. You should leave your oh, camera off and you the connection might be a little bit more stable. Yes, we can hear you now. You should turn your camera back off so that doesn't happen again. Reduce the bandwidth you're sending out. Okay, camera's off. You get to look at horses. All right. Awesome. Uh, is this better? Okay. Much. Okay, I'm going to start over. So here's what I was trying to say. A monocrop does not grow enough microbes in the soil to have a healthy plants. They're not healthy enough to fight off pests and disease. That's the point. You need to have 250,000 species to have a really healthy soil. And you can only get up to that number of species of microbes in the soil, if you have four 
plant species growing together. So you need some weeds in your garden. You need to mix them up. Uh, the old plants on um, companion planting would say, oh, plant this plant with that plant, and it works great. And then the next article you read says that it didn't work great. I don't think it's the plants you're planting together. It's the fact that you need a whole bunch of different plant families growing together. So if you plant pumpkins and um, pumpkins, cucumbers, and squashes together, how many plant families is that? Who can answer that? I'll answer it. It's one. one. Curcubits. It's one. They're all curcubits. Let me do this again. Here's another test for you. What if I had potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants growing together? How many plant families is that? It's one plant family. It's the nightshade family. So we have to do some research and figure this out. Let me do one more test. I'll give you a hint. This is one plant family. Cauliflower, broccoli, kale, turnips, cabbages. There's probably six or seven more. They're all one plant family. They're called brassicas. Okay? So it's very simple. All you have to do is go to Google and you type in what plant family is cabbage. And it will pop right up. It's a brassica. Very, very simple because we have Google. Okay? You don't have to become a plant botanist or anything else to know all this just type it into google and then pick four plants you want mingle them together so if you have a row of beets put some carrots in there put some basil in there put some oregano in there grow it with your tomatoes grow it with onions we should be growing onions with all those plants anyway we should grow onions and garlic with every plant in there actually don't grow onions well let me think Probably we shouldn't be growing them with the cabbage family. But anyway, that's a whole different class. Stephanie, you had your hand up. Go. Yeah, um, that, that's what I was going to bring up. My cabbages got so big and I did not space them. So I lost a lot of cabbages because I couldn't, they couldn't grow. So I ripped them out and then they started growing. So I, I didn't know that they were all brassicas. So all those are trick questions for me. But um, I, I can't think of anything I can grow with my cabbage or my broccoli because it, it takes over. It's so big. My broccoli plants are huge. My cabbages are huge. I can't think of anything to companion grow with those. Uh, so grow them along the edge of your garden where the roots will mingle with your grass. Now you have two plant families. Okay. And on the other side of the brassicas, plant a row of um, like onions. Now you have a third plant family. And then um, underneath the cabbages, you could scatter in something like lettuce or claytonia, or you could put creeping thyme underneath there. So there's several things you could grow together. Here's the other thing. I, I've, I've if, seen your cabbages and they're huge. They take up your whole row. How do you even have room, even if you put it on the outside? You don't, you just jump over them. <laughs> you okay. just get creative okay. you get creative okay. we got to stop thinking about a row of cabbages put a cabbage every 10 feet put mix them up so that if you have okay. a patch of corn and it's mostly corn put 10 cabbages in that corn patch so it's going to look crazy oh, okay. your garden will not look it will not have the same aesthetics as other people's gardens is there a tree growing right. near you if you have a tree growing yes. near your garden, well, that's another plant family. Those re roots are near the surface. So, so your lawn, the cabbage, and the tree, there's three plant families. All you need to do is put a couple of basil plants around it. And if the basil plant gets crowded out, that's okay because it's there for soil health to help grow that cabbage. It wasn't there to grow the basil. So we kind of have okay, to Okay, so what if different. you have some plants that are just too tall? Plants that are too what? Tall, because I, I was growing my artichokes, and then I was like, hey, let's throw in some corn. And and they and they took off, of course, because corn grows so fast. But my artichokes, they look like they're struggling. I don't know if they're struggling or not, but they're not getting nearly as much sun as they were before the corn was there. So is that not a good idea? 
the corn does need full sun and the artichokes both need full sun. So you probably need to just give them more space. Okay. Everything needs space. The corn and the artichokes both need full sun. So you just want to space them out more. And just find things. I have a small question. Okay, hold hold on, Zeke, a minute. Stephanie, go ahead and say that again. And just find things smaller to put in between them, like yeah. carrots. I guess yes. carrots keep growing. Yeah, they get about a foot tall. But it, if anything gets super shaded, then it's you know, I mean, it's going to struggle. But you know. Okay, okay let, let, you got to think about it different, Stephanie. Here's the thing. Go ahead and space stuff. Like cabbages need to be almost two feet apart, okay? But just have other things mm -hmm. in the garden. You don't have to, they don't have to be right next to it. Because So if you put a, a, a cabbage and then two feet apart, you put um, 10 carrot plants, that's the same thing. You're still mingling roots. They don't have the plants don't have to be touching because mm -hmm. the roots are going to go way underground and be all over the place. Right. Think of it like I, a I jungle. Mean... You have to make a jungle. Mm -hmm. All right, Zeke, what were you saying? So I have a similar ish question. So uh, in my garden, a lot of my brassicas did very, very well as plants. My kale was basically the only one I could really get a big harvest out of, though. Um, most of my brassicas, my broccolis, and my cauliflower, my barney flower, and my, my cabbages got massive. Like, I measured one, and it was like five feet across. But that broccoli never put on a broccoli head, and then it started to die. And so what did I do wrong? <laughs> Um, it sounds like you are growing an early succession plant in mid succession. Maybe it, because I know that I've been talking to you about inoculating everything with really good compost, you probably have, and maybe you have too much fungus in the soil. Question for you, Zeke Did you have mm -hmm. um, any kind of onions, anything in the onion family? So, onion, garlic, shallots. Were any of those growing near this giant plant that died? Within 10 feet. They weren't right next to it, but they were within 10 feet, I think. I'm not sure how close it's close in this context. Okay, well, 10 feet probably was far enough away. The reason I'm saying that is because mycorrhizal fungi acts like a disease to early succession plants. That's why when we get to mid-succession, we can stop the growth of weeds, okay? So maybe you had so much nutrition and your mineral cycle was working so well in your mid-succession range that your plant grew like crazy, but then it got colonized, the roots got colonized with mycorrhizal fungi and it killed your plant, your early succession brassica. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, that makes me feel good about my soil care, but also I wanted a head of broccoli. So, <laughs> so what, how, so in, let's go back and think about nature. What does nature do to grow early succession plants? Not what people do. What does Mother Nature do? Does anybody know? A natural disaster <laughs> happens. Mother Nature creates a natural disaster. There's a forest fire. There's a volcano. Right. There is a, there's a flood. There's a landslide. And it creates bare earth. And that kills mycorrhizal fungi because now there's no plants growing and plants own, or, excuse me, and mycorrhizal fungi only grows on living roots. So... If you want the early succession plant to grow and you're in mid-succession, till your garden. Can you believe that came out of my mouth? Most no, people can't believe it when I say to kill. But you've got to mimic Mother Nature. If you want to grow weeds, and you got to remember, brassicas are weeds. They're in that group of early succession plants. 
if your soil is growing the really beneficial fungus, which is the hardest thing to restore into the soil, and you want to grow brassicas, you have to create a natural disaster. And that means tilling the soil. I'm confused because cabbages and broccoli make these giant leaves. So they are covering the soil. Right. And that's what early... They're keeping it shaded. They're keeping yeah, it that's wet. A, how do exact... we... Okay, keep going. Just water it less? I mean, I, I can't quite see how we're going to create a fire. You know what I mean? Well, you... What I'm saying, Stephanie, you've got to think about what Mother Nature does. When a forest fire goes through, it kills all the living plants, at least most of them. So we go from late succession right. to early succession. Have you ever been to a forest fire right. area two years after the fire went through? You usually can't walk through that land because the weeds are so thick. Because that's what Mother okay. Nature does to heal the soil. So next year... You, if you want to grow the brassicas, till up your soil. That is a that is creating a natural disaster. That's what Mother Nature thinks has happened, and so the weed seeds will all start to sprout, and that's exactly what your uh, your cabbages family is, or early succession weeds, and so they should do better there. Now Ezekiel, that's only true if that's what your um, if that's what your problem was. But you obviously didn't have malnutrition because your plant grew to be huge. And then it died. So the only thing that makes sense to me is it was infected with mycorrhizal fungi. That's completely logical of what would have happened. I have a related follow-up question that should be a little bit quicker. Um, this next growing season, we're looking into moving garden plots from one spot to most of the soil that I've worked with in this will be removed for a project they want to use the space for. What I'm wondering is if I dig it up in big chunks and put it in a wheelbarrow and avoid breaking it up too much, can I maintain a lot of that soil health I've built over the last season and just like go put this on top of the bad soil in the new spot? Yes, that'll work. Does that work? Yes, that will work. Cool. Because the fungal hyphae will not be completely destroyed. It's when you completely pulverize it with a tiller or a disc and then it sits in the hot sun and it dries out that it dies. You could move it in hunks and it would work out fine. Okay, Ephraim typed a question in the chat. I have some corn that was started late and it's not doing very well. How can I revive it? Give it a shot of nitrogen fertilizer. You could, If you want to be organic bent, go to the store and get some fish emulsion and dump on it. Or you could use a fish hydrolysate, either one. Fish emulsion is easier to get, but that's nitrogen. If you don't care about organics, you could just go buy some miracle Grow. But that will revive the... It will revive the corn to get it going good. It needs a shot of nitrogen. But let me ask you another question, Ephraim. What color are the leaves of the corn? Are they yellow or are they dark green? Sorry, you cut out. I didn't hear your question. What is the color of your corn? Is it yellow or dark green? Um, like the corn cobs or the just the leaves of the corn. The stumps. They're yellow. Yeah, they need nitrogen. Okay. They're nitrogen deficient. Most corn always is nitrogen deficient. It's why I gave you the answer before I found out what was actually wrong. Because <laughs> ninety nine percent of the time. Corn, if it's not doing well, it's nitrogen deficient. Okay. Is corn early succession? Um, I, I don't know what succession corn is. Corn probably acts like an early succession. It is an annual, so that would tell us early succession. The thing about corn is it's hard to find it in nature because it's man-made. Yes, it was made thousands of years ago, but it's certainly man-made. The, the Native Americans developed corn. Um, in their agricultural practices. It came from a native plant that grows in uh, Mexico called Teosinte. I can't spell it, so don't ask. I think it's T-E-O-S-E-N-T-E, -E, something like that. 
But teosinte, it's a, the plant that corn came from. We know that because of DNA testing. And uh, But, I mean, it's been cultivated by humans for who knows how long. Nobody knows. Maybe thousands of years. Maybe 10,000 years. So, so where do we find it in nature to know what succession it's in? I don't know. But it is an annual. So we will just call it an early succession. Any more questions? Stephanie, go ahead. Yeah, I, I really love I really love Ezekiel's question. I, I want to understand it better though. So I think maybe what you were trying to say was space out the broccoli. Okay, who was saying that? Me or Ezekiel? Well, when I was talking about the cabbages, you said space out the cabbages, right? So maybe yeah. if Ezekiel would have spaced out his broccoli, then it wouldn't have had the fungus issue. How far apart was your uh, broccoli, Ezekiel? Um, maybe a foot and a half-ish. I didn't expect it to get five feet across. It kind of killed the broccolis next to it. Yeah. Mine did that same thing. However, you talk something about onions and garlic, and I had garlic at the end of my row, and my, my broccoli took off once I harvested my garlic, but I have no idea why that even makes sense. Well, the broccoli, um, everything in that cabbage family, they're all over succession, and so they need to have bacteria in the soil massive amounts of bacteria compared to fungus and uh, the uh, garlicers no 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 i'm talking about the the brassicas which is the cabbage family so the allium family which is your garlic yeah okay let me repeat this again i'll start over the cabbage family needs massive amounts of bacteria in the soil to thrive very small amounts, okay. maybe no fungus, okay? Now, on the other end of the spectrum, okay. the allium family, which is the onion and garlic, shallots, all of those things, those need a lot more fungus in the soil than bacteria because they're closer to late succession, mm. all right? So when we grow okay. those together... It's fine to grow them together to a point, all right, to a point, because the allium family will collect the mycorrhizal fungi. The mycorrhizal fungi is attracted to it. It's one of the best ways to create mid and late succession okay. soils, if that's what you want. So if you're growing those next to your cabbages, there's a possibility that you could fix your soil so quickly that it could start killing out your cabbage family. So it's a good idea to mm -hmm. not grow those together. I have never really seen that happen when people are starting new gardens before. Usually it takes three or four years to get to that point. But you know, we're dealing with mother nature and anything could happen. So. so if I'm hearing you right, if I grow if I grow garlic next to my broccoli, the the bro the garlic will not the garlic will track the fungus and save my broccoli. Yet no. you said no. don't do that because it will it will attract the fungus and kill your broccoli. Ah, uh, that makes more sense. So it's not like a magnet; it will track the fungus and keep it away from my broccoli. It'll okay, okay hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. We got to go back to the basics here. There is good fungus and there is bad fungus. And everything I have talked about okay. tonight has been good fungus. We okay. want mycorrhizal fungus in our soils. Okay. okay. But it will kill early succession plants. And that's exactly why we want it, because we don't want our fields to be full of weeds. Now, when we're, okay. when we're talking home gardens in somebody's little tiny yard, it doesn't make quite as much sense why. But I deal with people who have hundreds of thousands of acres of land. 
I have an acquaintance in North Dakota. He farms 40,000 acres. His fertilizer bill is $500,000 a year. His herbicide bill is $150,000 a year. Let's not have him spend $150,000 anymore to toxify our food because there are better ways to grow food. So, right. so this is the perspective that I'm coming from. But it still is absolutely valid in our backyard gardens. I have a okay. follow-up question to that, if if I may. Yeah, please. Um, this is related to a couple of things we've talked about. And I, I just thought of it. Um, so let's say that you have a greenhouse. And this is kind of a two-part question. The first part is, if you had multiple greenhouses, would it be ideal to try and get the soil within each greenhouse to represent different stages of succession to idealize growing conditions? Absolutely. And the second half of that, okay, second half of that question, is there a specific kind of succession that works best in a greenhouse and maybe one that it works least good in a greenhouse? <clears throat> Okay, let me think about that. I've never thought about that. Give me a moment to ponder. I like all Ezekiel's questions. He can just ask all mine from now on. That's good. <laughs> this is called synergism. But, but simplify them for me, Ezekiel, because you're a lot smarter than me. So simplify them a little bit. <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. Yes, if you're going to build six greenhouses, Ephraim's getting ready to build a bunch of greenhouses right now. I don't know how many, maybe six of them. So, if you, so that's why when you decide on growing crops, you really need to know what you're going to grow before you start. Because if you're going to grow a whole bunch of brassicas, which is the cabbage family, you would want to have one greenhouse that stays in early succession. So you would right. only put bacterial food in that greenhouse to grow the bacteria. That means green, living, rotting plants in your compost. You would not have wood chips. You would not have the brown component in there. You would have bacterial dominant compost, and that's all you ever have in that greenhouse. Keep it in early succession. And then your beneficial, okay. um, your your beneficials, they don't have to be in there. You're like, because they're not beneficial for that succession. They're beneficial for a different succession. Does that make sense? So let's say you're going to grow strawberries. Where do we find strawberries in Mother Nature? Early, mid, or late? Somebody answer. Mid? Late succession in forests. They oh. are found in the forests in late succession when you go on a horse ride out through the mountains in the middle of the summer you find wild strawberries growing in quaking aspen forests and if you've never eaten a wild strawberry you have been deprived and your education is not full and i'm sorry but you can <laughs> continue to learn and have good experiences therefore strawberries are late succession so what are you going to do you can you can create one greenhouse that's just for strawberries and what are you going to do the soil? You're going to be putting down wood chips every year. You're going to be inoculating with a, a complete compost that has more fungus in it than bacteria. Okay. Every year, you're going to make sure that fungus is fed and happy and healthy. So if it's late succession, you feed fungus. If it's early succession, you feed bacteria. If it's a mid-succession, you feed a balance of fungus and bacteria. And where do you get these? Do you go to the store and buy them? No, nobody sells them. Hopefully in 50 years, we have those types of things on the shelves. Today, they do not exist because this is brand new science. The corporate world of creating products has not created viable products for this type of thing yet. We have to make our own compost to make this work. I have time for one more question tonight. Then we're going to wrap this up. Ephraim, um, Helena, do you guys have questions? We've got a lot of questions from other people. If you guys have questions, please unmute and ask <laughs> or type it in the chat. I can see my chat right now.
I'm not seeing anybody type, so. I will give my last question to the more talkative people. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I I don't have a question. I would just love it if you could give us a, an early, mid, and late succession plants. That would be nice. Okay. Early succession plant would be uh, would be uh, anything in the cabbage family. Okay. A mid succession plant would be um, wheat, oats, barley, corn, cotton, um, tomatoes. Tomatoes are getting towards late, but yeah. Late succession would be strawberries. Um, things in the onion family would be late. And there's a whole bunch of plants that I grow all the time and I don't even know. I don't know because the research has not been done. I mean, it'd be easy to do. If a person took three years and all they did is they planted every garden crop they could. So they probably had three or 400 different varieties of plants out there. And then they would grow each of, they would set up a garden soil that's early, mid and late. And then they plant all crops in each of those three. And then we see how they do. And we write down the information and when we publish it. Why can't somebody publish that? It'd be a three-year project. I'm sure there's a master's student out there that needs a master's degree. That would be a great research project. I should write a grant proposal. Anyway, I mean, we need to know. The world we live in needs this information. Okay, good night. I'm going to go ahead and close this down. The recording will be on my YouTube channel. All the recordings of all these Thursday night classes are on there. If you want to become a professional farmer, I am here available to help you with that. And we will see you next week on Thursday. Ephraim, we are consulting together. Make sure my Marco Polo is ringing a lot this week because you are paying big bucks for this. Good night. I love you. And I'm going to push end as soon as I can find the button.